Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22, verses 10 through 13, and then hold your finger at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. The Free State of Glory, Part 39, The Reward of Believers, Five Heavenly Crowns to Place, some say they're going to cast their crowns at Jesus' feet, I don't think we're going to throw anything at Jesus crowns to place at Jesus' feet because without him we can do nothing. Can somebody say amen? This is part six. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. This is why the great songwriter wrote uh, correctly, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Verse 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Don't try to change now. You've been this way all along. You've had opportunities to be saved and you rejected me. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. There's not going to have. There's not going to be much time for jumping lines. And behold, I come quickly. When Jesus comes, it's going to be quick. It's not going to be any messing around. Zip, bam, boom. He's right there, ready to get you. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, <clears throat> the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Holy Father God, we give you the glory, the praise, and the honor and uh, you sit high and you look low however we know that you're there and we know that you're here you know all about us and yet somehow you love us and we do not understand that I know I don't but I thank you for it I thank you for your love your mercy and your grace and for allowing things to be as well as they are in our lives and Holy Father God, because we realize they could be worse. Millions of people have had to evacuate their uh, dwelling place and they're on the road right now, some not knowing where to go and what to do. And we pray that you would comfort them and help them tonight. Some who are still in the water, so to speak, down below us, on the coast of Texas. Some, many thousands, are still in um, places that they have set aside for shelter. And all of us know how uncomfortable, uncomfortable that is to not, uh, not have our own place, our own bathroom, our own bedroom. And so, Lord, comfort them as only you can and help them to see you and to understand one day this will all be over. And there'll be no more crying, no more dying, no more pain, no more floods, no more fires. And no more trouble. And so, Lord, help us to endure hardness as good soldiers and press on holding up the bloodstained banner. 
uh, where we have sinned against you in any way, for Jesus Christ's sake, as your children, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness through the blood of Christ. Fill all of us with the unction, the anointing, the fruit, the liberty, and the power, the presence of your Holy Spirit, for without you we can do nothing. Lord, those who are traveling and are from our ministry here, grant them safe travels and protection. Save that soul that is near as hell. Revive those who are saved. Glorify your holy name and lift up your holy son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For without him, we are nothing and we can't do anything. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray in his name. Amen. You may be seated. The Free State of Glory, Part 39, The Reward of Believers, Five Heavenly Crowns, Part 6. Let me say at the outset, some of us will not get any rewards. Because some of us who name the name of Christ have not been obedient to God. We're not abiding in Christ. Fix it now. We're disobedient. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I don't know where Christians got the idea that they can be saved and sanctified. Uh, this is off right here. Look at it. Look at the screen. Fix it perfectly now. I don't know where Christians got the idea somehow, some way, some preacher line it up straight somehow some way some preacher has lied to people thinking that you can call yourself a Christian a follower of Christ and be mean as the devil be evil be hateful be a liar, be a cheat, be stubborn, disrespectful to God and to Jesus and to the authority figures over you. When Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Can somebody say amen? That's what Jesus said. And we have Christians in the church today who want to live like that. They want the benefits of Christ in their lives. And there are many. But they don't want to be, they don't want to be obedient to Christ. For you, my beloved, there will be no reward. You will be counted in the number of the rewardless. So let me uh, relieve you of uh, thinking that way. I don't know where you got that from. Why call you me Lord, Lord, Jesus said, and do not the things which I say. I shared with someone earlier today. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. Just do it. And God will help you. God will see your faith. He will hear and ask your prayers when you ask, ask him to help you. And, he, and then, however, there is a will involved. It's your will. 
Are you willing to do God's will or just do what you want to do? And quite frankly, some people in the church, they are terrorists. I created that word a long time ago or some time ago. They're tares. They're not wheat. They're not truly born again. They're imposters. Because if you have Christ living in your life, it will bother you when you sin, any kind of sin, and you will seek to get that right if you are a born again child of God. And this will begin happening almost immediately after you got saved. Yes, there's some grave clothes you got to take off in those early days. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but you will not feel happy about your sin as you felt before you got saved. Now, there's going to be a difference. You're going to feel very troubled when you sin, as we should. Amen, somebody. So, in the words and in the terminology of Seinfeld's uh, soup Nazi as he called them no rewards for you no rewards if you don't love God back because he first loved you I don't want you to think stupidly and foolishly If you don't love him enough to obey him and when you mess up you confess up and you repent up and you get your heart right with God and you stay that way and when you mess up again you confess your sins and you repent and you get your heart right with God it bothers you it troubles you it causes you pain in your soul and in your spirit when you do wrong and I assure you that if that's not the case and you love sin more than you love God you don't know Jesus you're a terrorist <clears throat> you're just one of the tares that God told us to let you grow with the wheat and don't try to pull them out you are a phony you are a hypocrite you are a fake you are you are an imposter you say, well, that, that won't keep a crowd. I'm not trying to keep a crowd, obviously. <clears throat> I'm not trying to... Uh, someone said, well, preacher, if you want to win bees, uh, use uh, some honey or something like that. I said, I'm not trying to win bees. I don't want any bees. God wants disciples who love him back so much that they would obey him and so today beloved we are going to by the grace of God continue looking at the five crowns <clears throat> spoken of in Holy Scripture as rewards for believers those who are obedient to Christ who love Jesus who love God the first crown is the imperishable crown which is given to those who give their all in service to Christ, not to those who try to hinder uh, God's service and God's work. Be, be very careful about folk in the church who are always negative and always complaining and always criticizing and never doing anything to help the cause of Christ. In fact, they are Judases and they try to tear down every good work. I saw a church the other day. They were filling boxes and truckloads of stuff to send down to the folks in Houston, things that are necessary. They were working together like bees. Guess what? They had, they're right here in the Dallas area had smiles on their faces while they were doing it giving millions of dollars of stuff to people who will never be able to repay them and the uh, and the young pastor was just beaming with 
the smile of God on his face. That's how it ought to be. Excited. And uh, the people worked hard. They were working hard, packing boxes and packing bags to send to the hurting people down in Houston. And the pastor said, it does something in your heart when you help others. And that's right. How about it, dear Christian friend? Are you excited tonight about serving God? Are you happy about serving God? Or you can't wait till it's over? Are you happy when other people are doing well and you're not? They have a ministry that you don't and, and because they love God and you don't? Why, why be envious and by, why be jealous of them? If you are a child of God, join them. Help them to do the ministry. And then maybe God will give you an, a ministry once you show yourself to be faithful. Once you show yourself that you love God. For ultimately, my beloved, it is all about you loving God. Do you love God back? Do you love Jesus back? They first loved you. And they want you to love them back. They're not going to make you. But you should. And that ought to motivate you to do great things for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? The second crown is the crown of rejoicing. Which is received by those who win souls for Christ. Are you a soul winner? Uh, are you concerned about souls? And they help disciple new believers. And the third crown is the crown of righteousness, which is given to those who finish their course well on this earth and who look for and love the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the fourth crown is the crown of glory, which Peter writes about in his first epistle. 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 and 4 says, The elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof not by constraint, but willingly, not like a Hitler, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, that's in the King James Version, of course, not for money, preacher, but for, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. When the chief shepherd shall appear, that is Jesus, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. I'm reminded of a church. Uh, the church was a soul winning church and trying to do great things for God. Uh, but there was a small group of people in the church. The name of this church uh, was uh, so-and-so Baptist Church. I'm not going to give you the full name. But there was a, there was a lady in the church who uh, led her husband and their family and hooked up with a few other people and left the church and started another church called Crown of Glory Church. Because evidently they felt that the pastor at the Baptist church was not going to win a crown of glory. Because he was not a good pastor. So they went out and called themselves slapping him back. Went down the street and started a church called Crown of Glory Church. And uh, they were going to be the pastors who uh, win the crown of glory. And I believe that that church is defunct now. But... Uh, be that as it may, this is talking about the crown primarily for elders or pastors. And every pastor is not going to get this crown. 
In this passage, beloved, Peter is talking to elders or shepherds, pastors in the church, those who are over other believers, leading them like a shepherd leads a flock of sheep, teaching them, protecting them, guiding them. Some commentators have pointed out that the crown of glory is not for elders or pastors only, but they do have a special calling to care for God's sheep by following the example of the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. I like what Chuck Swindoll said about it. He said, with regard to the role of leaders in the church, Peter has pointed out two effective principles to deal with. One is pride of position must be absent, and the heart of a shepherd must be present. And by the way, let me add to that, that every preacher should not be a pastor, primarily because he does not have the, uh, he's, not a, he's not a general practitioner, he does not have the heart of a pastor, of a shepherd. The heart of the evangelist and the heart of the pastor, my dear friends, are two different things. You would think so, but the heart of a true, pure evangelist, his church will normally not grow as big as a church where, where the pastor uh, is there with a pastor's heart and a shepherd's heart. Two different callings. Uh, and that is if an evangelist even tries to pastor a church. God may use him to start a church, but uh, it is not his place to stay there and pastor the church. He needs to be seeking a shepherd who has a shepherd's heart as fast as possible. He then illustrated... Uh, Chuck Swindoll said, he then illustrated the shepherd's heart with three essential attitudes. Number, number one, willingness. And that would include cheerfulness. A true pastor cheerfully and willingly serves the people of God. He loves it. He loves it. He loves to, he doesn't want folks to have problems, but he loves uh, hearing about their problems, their troubles, their gripes, their complaints. He has the capacity to do it, and he loves it, and he do does it in a winsome fashion, a happy fashion, and he loves the people, and the people love him. Willingness, and then eagerness. There ought to be an eagerness about a man who is a true pastor. He ought to be willing and eager, energetic about doing the work of pastoring. It's not a real burden to him. This is what he does. He's excited about it. Yes, he gets weary and well-doing sometimes. Like all other human beings, he gets tired. He gets... Uh, discouraged, but he has a heart for it. If he can get some sleep and relax and, and, and maybe watch a ball game every now and then and spend some time with his wife alone and uh, spend some time with the family by the pool or whatever. Travel a little bit, take a vacation, he'll come back stronger than ever. He's eager to get back. He loves the flock of God. He has a genuine heart of love and compassion for the people. He is not fake. He is not phony. And when you give somebody a hug in the church, they know he means it. He is real. And then meekness. Meekness. Granted, he said, shepherding the flock of God can involve hard work. 
This is why Peter ends his address to the elder pastors of the churches with a reminder of their eternal reward if Christ's shepherds faithfully discharge their duties with the proper attitudes they will receive the unfading crown of glory from Christ at his return. As the chief shepherd, Jesus serves as the model of how his earthly shepherds are to serve. As such, Christ himself is the perfect model of ministry. Amen, somebody. And I have much more to say tonight, uh, but I believe that I have to do a little traveling tonight, and I'm going to cut it short. And we will pick up here if the Lord should tarry his coming next week. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you for sending us pastors. Pastors who love you back, who trust you, who fear you, who obey you, and who are faithful to you. Have mercy and grace upon us all. And uh, Lord, for Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us of our sins. We may not be pastors, uh, but we do have a ministry. We have a responsibility. We are responsible for winning others to you and uh, teaching others and discipling others. And so in a smaller sense, we are, we are all pastors. And, can, uh, and some of us can win the pastor's crown or the crown of glory if we serve faithfully over the small Sunday school flock that you put before us or the small group flock. And so, Lord, help us to be just as faithful as the man of God, the pastor of the church, is expected to be. And we pray that you would use us in the last days that we have on earth for your glory, your praise, and your honor. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, beloved, before I leave you tonight, are you ready for the second coming of Christ? Are you ready for the rapture of the church? If you're not ready, if you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you need to get ready. Allow me to show you how. First, accept the fact, dear friend, that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's law. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty, there is a punishment always for sin. The Bible states in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. Third, accept the fact that you are on the road to hell once you die. If you're not born again, if you're not saved, if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, you will die. All of us will die physically and be buried and put in the grave. Our bodies will go to the grave. Our souls will go to hell if we have never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Jesus Christ said as much in Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the bad news, but I have some good news for you. Jesus Christ said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All you have to do, dear friend, is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it is that simple. Acknowledge that you are a sinner. Admit that you have sinned and that you're willing to repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And pray and ask him to save your soul and he will save you. If you're willing to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, According to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou, that if you shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For whosoever 
shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. And saved to heaven. Follow me in prayer. A prayer called the sinner's prayer. Repeat it after me, phrase by phrase, and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I admit that I have done evil in my life. I've stolen things. I've lied about things. I've had lustful thoughts. I've had sex with people outside of marriage. And many other sins that I deserve to go to hell for. Please have mercy and grace upon my soul. And forgive me of all of my sins. For Jesus Christ's sake. As I now believe with all of my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. That he died for me. Was buried. And rose again. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. And change my life. Fill me with your blessed Holy Spirit. And help me to repent of my sins past. And to follow you in the new life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Beloved, if you just trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you prayed that prayer with me and you uh, meant it from your heart, I declare to you that based upon the Word of God, you are now born again. You are now saved from sin and hell. It is as simple as that. You're on your way to heaven. Regardless of what the devil might say, Regardless of what others might say, regardless of what your mother might say, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. So welcome to the family of God. Congratulations on doing the most important thing in life, and that is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for Jesus Christ uh, is the one who paid the price for you. Now for more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, Please go to GospelLightSociety.com and read my pamphlet, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Until next time, my beloved, God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you. Real good is my prayer.